So can you see the screen from home? See. Sí. Okay. Good enough. So let's continue from where we left. In fact, we left from here. So can you, so first of all, you can see that we have uh, this is rather uh, there you go. So we have the we are within the absolute nodal formulation, and in particular we are dealing with isoparametric elements. And if you recall, we are we were describing the 2D rectangular element. Okay, so just to to recall, uh, it should be this one. Yeah. So this is an image. Hmm? Of the uh, of the element that we are trying to derive, as you can see, it's a two. It's a, we're in the plane, uh, and we have a, a rectangular element. It's an isoparametric element, meaning that we are uh, all only taking displacement and positions as uh, nodal coordinates. Okay, so so displacements. And positions as nodal coordinates. Meaning that there is no rotation yeah, in these elements. And since we are, and it's called uh, isoparametric. Why? It's called isoparametric as we were already, uh, you know, introducing this uh, last time, because you can use the same um, interpolating functions to reconstruct either the position, either the displacement field within the element, starting from the solution that we get at the nodes, uh, because this is again the the function of the shape functions. Uh, sorry for the repetition. Um, so these kind of elements have, you know, they have drawbacks, they have uh, pros, you know, a, a, along the, among the, the pros, we can say that it's a rather simple formulation, just for what I said is one of the, one of the reasons. So it's, uh, you can use the same interpolating function to reconstruct different uh, physical fields. But for example, between the cones, you can say that since there are no, uh, rotations in this kind of element, it's very hard to implement boundary condition or constraints involving rotations. For example, a hinge, very difficult. Uh, that's why, and I anticipate this to you, in fact, we moved forward uh, eventually towards, um, uh, for example, shell elements or beam elements, where you have rotation as, node, as nodal coordinates. Uh, but we will see there is a cost to that. Um, so again, we uh, what we were trying to uh, what we were trying to say here is that these nodal coordinates that I can uh, encircle in red here, for example, uh, just just to make a few examples, these are always referred to the inertial frame x1 and x2. You see here they are perpendicular uh, uh, with respect to x1 and x2, and they stay perpendicular to x1 and x2. And why is that? Because again, we are within an absolute nodal formulation. So all of the formulation is described with respect to the inertial frame. Huh? So that's why. Uh, what we were trying to do, if you recall it, was to derive the formulation okay, for the position of, these, uh, of, of the nodes, and in particular, for all the points within the element. We uh, we made an assumption. Okay, here we have eight 
coordinates. You know? So it means that if we want to use a, a polynomial expansion, as we typically do, we need at least eight coefficients uh, to, to be determined in order to be able to encompass eight uh, nodal coordinates you know, within our formulation. And for a reason of symmetry, we went for a Q, let's say, uh, um, a four, uh, let's say, a four uh, coefficients polynomial in the uh, x, y direction and x2. Okay, so the same the symmetrical polynomial expansion. So we wrote the following. Uh, just you know to recall a little bit what we were doing. So the position of a point within the element with respect to the inertia frame, and that's why I'm calling P, eh, because P is the typical notation that we use for this, could be written as, for, as such. Uh, where x1 and x2, make no mistake, uh, they are the components, uh, so for example, this one, this one, and this one too, they are the components of this vector here. You see x0 over bar within our element. What is x0 over bar? It's exactly the element counterpart of what we previously introduced as, as R0 over bar. Uh, R0 over bar was the position of a point with respect to the local frame of the body. Okay. In its in the formed, on the form configuration. Sorry. Uh, while in this case, X0 over bar is the position in, in the form configuration of a point within the element with respect to X. Uh, I1 and I2, which are the two coordinates, in this case, in the plane of the element. Okay, so again, make no mistake, the position is expressed with respect to X1 and X2 capital letters, but the functional dependency of this uh, field is expressed with respect to the local coordinates of the element. Okay, all right. And again, as I was mentioning, for symmetry reason, we basically, oops, we did the same in the x2 uh, direction. So we have something written as such. Okay. So as, there is no reason for, for, for me uh, to introduce an asymmetry in the, in the description of the field. That's why I'm, I'm going for this. Please. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. So this is, these are written within, with respect to the uh, inertial frame. These are written with respect, these are taken to with respect to the local frame of the element. Okay. Okay. That's actually the characteristic uh, approach of the absolute nodal formation. That's why it's called absolute, uh, because it's written with respect to the uh, inertia frame. Now, if we want to rewrite this in a matrix form, we saw that we could rewrite this in the following way. Okay, so the position P is equal to a matrix, uh, of, let's say, of uh, functional dependence times A, which is a matrix or a vector of coefficients. Uh. So in fact, uh, we can rewrite the following. A was basically just, again, a vector of the coefficients. Uh. While phi 
is a matrix, just as you can see, which just takes into account the functional dependency. Huh? Like so. There you go. Hmm? Uh, yeah, it's a matrix. All right. Now, as we have already seen and we have already implemented uh, previously, we have to imp impose the, uh, the equality uh, of the of this expression of the of this expression of the positions with the solution at the nodes, no? meaning that when I uh, put inside this expression this polynomial expression the coordinates of the nodes, I have, I have to get the nodal coordinates e1, e2, e3, and so on, right? And and the, from this uh, imposition of uh, let's say boundary condition, if you want, we get the um, the coefficients. Hmm? So let's do it. We can re reward it like so. So we impose the nodal values e. Eh? We can we can call it. Uh, like so, uh, the vector of nodal coordinates, so again. To P of X, uh, zero, to the field P of zero, at the nodes position at the nodes are coordinates to get the A's. Huh? That's what we are doing. How do we do that? We do it uh, like so. So we have, for example, that P one of the first point on the left uh, bottom part, so E1. Uh, uh, so mini, ah, sorry. I, I forgot to mention one thing, but this is instrumental. So we can assume that this value here, uh, it's 2B, 2 times B, mm, and this instead, is two times C, okay? And please note that uh, the um, the local frame of the element is in the middle, okay? This is this can, I mean, this is an arbitrary choice, but uh, for the case at hand, it's uh, this is what uh, what we have to consider. Meaning that here I have to write that. The, posi the position of po along uh, P1, X1 of what? For example, node one. So we have minus B minus C must be equal to what? To E1, right? Again, do not uh, uh, make a mistake. E1 is not a displacement in this case, it's a position, okay? So E1, I know that the image can be a little bit misleading, but here E1 is this one. Huh? This is E1, okay, for node 1. Hmm? Is this clear? Okay. And we do this, the following for all the nodes. So a little bit of patience and we do it. <coughs> So for node one, we have the P2 of what again? Minus B minus C is equal to E2. Huh? And then we have that E1 of B minus C is equal to E3. 
and P2 of B minus C is equal to E4. Hmm? And so on. If you want, I can write a mole, but it's a little bit longer. Huh? It's for four nodes. If you want, I can write, but okay. So P1 of B, C, B2, my mistake, sorry. Let's just mute it. Okay, sorry. And then we have again P2 of B, C, which is P6. And then P1 of um, minus B, C is equal to E7. P2 of minus B, C is equal to E8. Huh? You know, so I have these eight conditions. This is node one, node two, node three, and node four. Hmm? If you want. Um, we can, in fact, rewrite all these conditions in a matrix form as well. Huh? So we can write the following. Matrix form we have that E must be equal to phi with an overbar, uh, with an overbar applied to A, the vector of coefficients, where we have that um, this matrix phi overbar is the following matrix. One, zero, one, zero, one, zero, then we go. We have minus B, minus C, BC, and then you have four zero. Okay, here you have zero, zero, zero. And you have one, minus B, minus C, B, C. Then you have one, B, minus C, minus B, C. Zero, 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 zero. So you see, I'm actually rewriting just, you know, the, the coefficient that's uh, it's a little bit, uh, Tedious, but you know, for the sake of clarity, let's go through it quickly. One B minus C minus B C. So we have one B C B C again. And then the last two, we have minus B C minus B C. Okay, why did we go all through this? Because now we are going to derive what was our, our initial goal. That's to say the coefficients. Huh? We need to find the coefficients of that polynomial exp uh, expansion so that we are able to, in, you know, to interpolate the, you know, the position of the displacement of whatever field we want to represent within each point of the element starting from the, the same quantity of the nodes. Okay, that's, uh, that's the, the reasoning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry? The third one? Ah, yes, yeah, sure. No. Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, I lost one. You're correct. The third one, yeah, it's one, BC. Correct. Yeah, yeah, there was one missing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
uh, in fact, uh, maybe if, if I can just, uh, you know, go on a little bit advanced, then it will be clearer, maybe. Um, from here, if this is true, and it is true, uh, because it's just the, you know, the conditions we have in force, you can say that A, sorry, A, is equal to what? To this matrix, to the minus one, sorry, with an overbar, uh, to A, okay? So if we know the nodal coordinates, through the inversion of this matrix, we can uh, derive the coefficients. But we needed the coefficients for what? For this. You remember that P, as we have said before, was equal by definition of Psi, not with the overbar, equal to A. Okay. Therefore, if I substitute this in, in this expression, huh, what I get, so A from here to here, if you want, I can write it in red, maybe it's uh, a little bit clearer. A, can I have this one and put it here. And therefore, this means P equal to phi times phi over bar to the minus one times E, correct? Why is it important? Because this way we have achieved our goal. We are able to relate the position of each point within the element, and that's what I was uh, you know, talking about before. Starting from the solution at the nodes. These two matrices here, they are called C. And this is the element shape matrix. Okay by definition. So we can write. See. No. So your colleague is asking if this inversion is always possible. And if you know, when is it, when, when is it that we can call a matrix to be singular? From a mathematical point of view, we are enforcing a series of equations here, in fact. So, what is the condition by which you have a singular matrix? So, meaning that you are enforcing two conditions which are basically equivalent. Or, if you want, one can be get as a linear combination of the others, at least one. But as you can see now, if you have independent nodes, this cannot happen simply. So that's why you can always inverse, invert this matrix. Okay. okay. So we define C as the element shape matrix. Hmm. And we have again that P is equal to C times E. Huh? And this is typical of uh, an element type. Okay. Uh, in our case, if you do all the math, so if you actually invert uh, phi over bar, you multiply by phi. In our case, for, uh, for d to d rectangular element at end, uh, 
you have the C as the following structure. Is N1, 0, N2, 0, N3, 0, N4, 0, and then in an alternate way, where we have the following. So N1 is just the name of a, an expression which goes like this for B C B minus X one zero over bar times C minus X over bar two zero. Okay, so this is just the name of polynomials. And two is one over four B C. B plus X one over zero. C minus X two zero over bar. And then again, and three. And last but not least is M4. Okay. Yeah. So this basically is the element shape matrix of a rectangular 2D element. Huh? This, uh, uh, as I said, is the element type which we call isoparametric and, well, no. This is an element type which only encompasses position and displacement as nodal coordinates. In particular, we, within this category, we, we made reference to isoparametric, isoparametric elements. And in this case, to a, a 2D uh, rectangular element. But we can always uh, also introduce another type of element. Huh? And we will now derive another, the, the same quantity, but for another type of element, Oops. which is the two uh, non isoparametric. element. In particular, we're going to get the um, 1D beam element. Okay. Okay, so let's import a picture here. Hopefully it's this one. Yeah. So that's the one. All right. Um, so you see now we are always within the absolute nodal formulation. So we are always describing the position of a point within the element with respect to the inertial frame uh, with the functional dependence expressed in terms of the uh, local coordinates of the element. Okay. In this case, we have another element type. It's a non isoparametric one in which we have not only position and or displacement as nodal coordinates, we also have small rotations. Hmm? You can see it here in this picture, A, huh? E3 and E6, they are the rotation at the nodes. Yeah. Um, we will see that this has significant uh, consequences in terms of uh, modelization. Just, you know, to clarify this, uh, because sometimes it can puzzle uh, the students. When we talk about 1D element or 2D elements or whatever, we do not refer to the space, to the nature of the space they live in. 
because this can also live in the 3D space, as it's living here in the 2D space. When we talk about 1D or 2D elements, we refer to the, fun to the order of functional dependence they have inside. So in this case, the only variable is the coordinate along I1, you see here. The, which, and this makes the formulation 1D, okay, even if it's, you know, living in the 2D space. Because sometimes, you know, some students can get uh, confused by that. Oops. All right, so hypothesis here, the characteristic hypothesis element is that we have displacement or position as nodal coordinates. Plus rotation. Okay, this is the, the addition hmm? with respect to what we have before. Now again, we have to, so we assume a certain uh, expression for the position field within the element. Okay. So again, we have to write something for P1 and P2. In this case, only as a function of, again, the coordinate, the local coordinate along I1. So that would be x0 over bar 1, okay? In this case, is there any kind of assumption that you would make? Do you have an idea uh, regarding, you know, the poly always talking about polynomial expansion? Uh, can you have an idea on that? We already, in fact, had some uh, experience in that. This is a beam. So how many nodal coordinates do we have? Look at the picture. Right? We have six. So how many coefficients do we do we need? Six. Uh, do you have any idea on how to distribute the six coefficients in the polynomial expansion here and here? Correct. Why would that be? Why? Okay, so your colleague said basically it's a uh, linear here and cubic here. Huh? And why would that be a, a fair assumption? Because in fact, you are referring to a particular physical model, which is Euler you, Robin Pier, Euler Robin Pier. Okay. So we have already said, in absence of distributed loads, because if there are distributed loads, as you know, we have an higher order, or at least for, uh, in fact, both for actual and transverse displacement. So, we can write A0 plus A1, X10. Yeah. And then we can write A2 plus A3, X10 plus A4, X10 squared plus A5 x10 to the third. Uh, and this is again, this Euler model. OK, 
just uh, for the sake of my curiosity, do you actually encounter something different from this in terms of models for BIM so far? Have you ever studied something more complicated than that? No, that's the only model for BIM that you that you know, Timoshenko BIM. No. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. And so for uh, for plates, you only have uh, what? Kirchhoff plate then. Mindrin plate? No. Have you ever heard of Mindrin plate? Von Karman? Come on. No. Okay. Okay. okay just for for the sake of curiosity. Um, you know that, okay, this is just a, a, bit of, you know, a little parenthesis for, for you to know if you want. Um, if you have um, a quite slender beam in which the, the, let's say, the ratio of the thickness of the beam with respect to the length, to the span, is lower than, uh, I would say, uh, 50, uh, then you can classify it as a slender beam. And if the and in this case, you can assume that the, during your deformation, the cross section of the beam stay always orthogonal to the neutral axis of the beam, and that this is uh, Euler beam. If you have a rather thick, uh, you know, cross section beam, so for example something which is lower than that uh, than that one over fifty. Then you have to encompass the effect of non-orthogonality of the cross section, because the, this non-orthogonality of the cross section, as you know, is related to the presence of shear. Okay, and then you have distortion, so that you usually call it gamma. And so gamma is non-zero for team, for me. It's constant, but it's not zero, because in, in Kirchhoff, sorry, in Euler is constant and it's zero, and that's why it's always orthogonal. The cross section to the uh, neutral axis. In Mindrin, it's constant, but it's not zero. If you go higher in, uh, in models, you get more complicated, Coursera, whatever. And the same exact um, reasoning translates in the 2D case for Kirchhoff Love uh, model, which is the analogous of uh, Euler beam. And then you have Mindlin model of plates, which is the analysis of Timoshenko. If you go higher, you can have von Karman which retains the first order, nonlinear order in the expansion of the displacement. For example, you should, you, I think you should use it in uh, some uh, uh, aerodynamics, maybe, von Karman, no? Okay, all right, so for you to know. And in fact, uh, um, these kind of elements, you, you, you find it in finite element codes, yeah? because these elements, as you can see, they are based on the physics. Now, if you use another physics, for example, in this case, Timoshenko beam, you have another physics. And then you have to know, but if you have an additional physics, for example, the Timoshenko, typically it's uh, more computational intensive. And then you have to be able to see, okay, is it enough to use a Euler beam uh, element type or not? Okay, so, and this will affect your computational time by orders of magnitude when you have a lot of points, a lot of nodes, okay? So be aware of that. Okay. So, I mean, uh, for the rest is basically just what we have seen already. So, we have P equal to phi apply to A, where A is equal again, in this case to, sorry, it starts from zero. <clears throat> you go. And phi Okay, again, we have to impose the conditions at the, at the nodes.
And so again, P1 at zero must be P1. P2 at zero must be equal to E2. P1 at L must be equal to E4. P2 at zero, uh, sorry, at L. So again, sorry, I missed it. The length of the element is L. Okay, that's, it. that's the length. Okay, so uh, pop, pop. Oh, yes, this is E5. Then we have P2 prime. So P2 prime is the derivative. Uh, I, call, I call the prime because we cannot, uh, you know, have misunderstanding regarding the, the meaning of this prime since we have only one variable, uh, which, which is x1 over bar for this model. And this would be equal to what? To the tangent of alpha in zero. What is alpha? Let's go back here. So you see what alpha is. Oops, sorry. Alpha is this one. Uh, can you get? Can you see it, or should I magnify it? So alpha is basically the angle, uh, the local angle that the beam, the the element forms with the under form with the sorry with the x1 um, axis okay so it's basically what the local derivative okay no surprises in fact this tangent oops, for small angles is equal to alpha Please make no mistake here. Eh? We are not talking about small angles due to um, a rigid body. We are talking about small angles induced by the deformation. Okay. And the same goes at L. So we have P. To prime at L uh, is equal to the tangent of alpha at L. And this is pretty much alpha at L. Oh, sorry. And this is equal to, to um, E3, and this is equal to E6, because this was the the reasoning, uh, okay, we, we go again with the, with the writing in, in matrix form. Huh? In matrix form, we have the P, sorry, let's write it like, uh, um, yeah, E equal to always an overbar and A, where again in this case we have that this matrix 
can be written as such. So it's one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, and then we have a set of zeros, one, two, three, four, and five. Then here we have an L. Then here we have a zero and one L, L squared and L to the third. Then we have zero, zero, these are the derivatives, no? Then we have one to L and three L squared. And again, we have the four here, A is equal to Psi to the minus one right over E. Therefore, again, P is equal to Phi C, sorry, phi over but with the minus one times E. We have again C. Okay. Um, okay, no surprises here. In particular, we can write C as such. For the 1D beam we have the C, the element shape matrix. It just follows. Maybe you have a, you remember of it. Maybe you remember of it somehow. Huh? Can you recognize this? We have already got this. We have already derived this exact same matrix. Do you remember this? When we rem when we were when we had to define the inertia sheet matrix for the deformable link of the uh, Slater Kank mechanism, we got exactly the same matrix. Why is that? Exactly. So in, in that case, uh, we had the same exact uh, physics, Euler beam model, and you can make a parallelism as if in this, in this, in our case here, we have a body composed of one element. Okay. If the body is composed of one element, then you get exactly the same shape matrix. Uh, this, uh, this is a, an element shape matrix before we have an inertia shape matrix. But of course, it has to stay the same, okay? With, of course, 
C, in this case, being equal to x1, 0, over bar, divided by L. Okay. Now, all the point here is, okay, this, so, we had, uh, you know, again, developed two, two different type elements in the same formulation. We have said, okay, some is more, uh, in, you know, fit to be for some application. Others are more fit for you know, constraints or hinges or so on, but okay. Why is there, in fact, uh, the need? Uh, I can go, I can work around, you know, these small differences. Why is there, in fact, the need to introduce these two element types and then eventually another formulation? Because as, as we will see now and partially now and tomorrow, from what we are going to see, there will, there will arise the need to define another formulation. What I'm saying is the following, and you probably are already aware of this. So when you talk about an element formulation, there is one requirement which is fundamental, which can be expressed roughly as such. If you increase the number of nodes, you should arrive to convergence of the solution. If you have an element, if you have a model, if you have a body, and you increase the number of nodes, you should approach to the solution. Okay? It should not oscillate, it should not diverge. Okay? You should always get something that eventually, as a good engineer, you would say, okay, you know, there is no need to further increase the mesh. Because the solution I can see is actually only changing of a small percent of error, which as I, as an engineer, deem sufficient. Okay, and this is something actually that not always is done as an engineer in practice to see the convergence of the numerical model. Typically, what, as, what is done in most firms is that, okay, you get the, the, the model, you do a mesh, you, you run it, and then you get the solution. Not quite, no, okay. Eight times over 10, you can, you can get away with that. But uh, there are those two times you pay for that. Meaning that you have, it's a good practice to always ascertain if your model is good enough, accurate enough, in terms of resolution of the mesh, okay? For these simple models, for linear models, it's always very easy. Uh, you, you don't need uh, too many nodes. Uh, you know, you don't need a cannon to shot to a bird, as they say. Uh, you need a few elements, it's enough. But for example, when you have no linearities, then you have to be careful, okay? But okay, why am I mentioning this? Because as we said, convergence is a requirement for the stability and in general for uh, the accuracy of the correctness, in fact, of an element uh, modelization. The uh, convergence, of uh, an element type can be, in fact, uh, associated to two um, uh, requirements. Uh, the first requirement is continuity. Continuity of the uh, formulation of the physics, of the physical field that you want to describe. In this case, position, we have polynomials. We have no problems with continuity and regularity, okay? It's fine. But then there is another one which is less intuitive, and we will see why. The condition that the element should be able to represent a state of constant strain. And we will see why. So, we turn the page here. And we can entitle this as. Uh, Energetic means
Okay, so energetic misrepresentation associated to element types, to various element types, in sorry, in absolute nodal formulation. So we said we have uh, a requirement. Which is uh, numerical convergence. Convergence. Okay, and this can be ascribed to two facts continuity. We have said that with polynomials, we are typically fine on this side. And then the capability to represent constant stress state. And now one could wonder, okay, but why constant stress state? You know, constant stress state is associated uh, also to zero stress state, for example. Huh? If you have a, a stress state equal to zero all over your element, that's a constant stress state, huh? just to as a particular case. Can you guess? of a condition in which you have zero stress within your dynamics of, the, of your multiple bodies that, you know, in which again, your multiple bodies are moving around, having a dynamics, and yet they experience a state of constant zero stress. We have a definition for that. A kind of motion for C's, Zero stresses all over it. What? Huh? Mm, free fall. It's a, it depends, but it's a particular case of a, a more general class of, of, of the motions that we have described. Rigid motions, by definition. Rigid motion, by definition, you have no deformation because they are rigid. And typically, if you, are, if you have no deformation, you should have no stress. Okay. 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 Um, then the question here is this requirement translate into the following one. Given that requirement number one on continuity is satisfied with, for polynomial physically, requirement number two can be exemplified as such. The capability to not, uh, to correctly represent a state of cost of stress, but of zero stress during rigid motion. Okay. And what is typically the consequence? Uh, I'm, I'm just elaborating on this so that you can follow the logic. What is the consequence of having no stress in your body? in terms of energy, elastic energy. What is the elastic energy content of a body which has zero stress? Zero. So in terms of requirement, we can say that convert, given again that continuity satisfied, convergence for an element formulation can be achieved, can be verified, as a necessary condition, not as a sufficient, but as at least as a necessary condition, if with that element you are able to get, you are able to encompass a rigid motion with, to which is associated as a state of zero elastic energy. Okay, is, is this clear? So you have a rigid motion, you describe it with your element, and eventually while you are describing it, you should see, you should have that the elastic energy stays zero all over your motion, rigid motion. That's at the very least to get convergence. If you don't get this, you're in trouble. 
Okay. So. Elastic energy stays equal to zero. For rigid motions, again, this is a, soft, is a necessary condition, but not sufficient for convergence, for, sorry, convergence. So again, what we are going to see partially now is that if we, if, when I use, for example, the 2D rectangular formulation or the beam element formulation, for the case of a rigid motion, I'm actually getting zero elastic energy. If I don't, I have a problem. Okay, is this clear? Questions? Mm -hmm. Uh, come again? Uh, Adams check. Well, Adams doesn't need to check it. In fact, um, for for certain types, okay. So, in terms of formulation types, uh, Adams, in fact, at least for certain class of problems, do not use absolute null formulation. So, you you don't have this kind of problem as we will see now. Um, but there are other codes, for example, I don't know if you've heard of it, LSDINA. LSDINA is from ANSYS. There okay. used to be Livermore Technology developed in Los Alamos, Los Alamos National Laboratory, the lab where they featured the first atomic bomb. They also developed this, and then it was acquired by ANSYS. Um, and in that case, that, uh, uh, that's an explicit code, it's not implicit, as it is Adams. You know the difference between explicit and implicit? Of sort? No worries, uh, here. So no, I mean, uh, implicit, uh, you basically have this kind of formulation. This is an implicit uh, uh, type of uh, formulation. And with these, I mean, all that we have derived so far with the inversion of a matrix, uh, at every iteration, if you have a nonlinear case. So these are implicit schemes. Explicit, uh, explicit schemes are the ones that you have, uh, for example, seen for, for the case of a fluid dynamics problem, uh, finite differences or so on, in which you have an, a, a, you know, a finite different scheme that repeats itself. So there is no inversion of a matrix. In that case, you have no problems of singularity because you do not have to invert a matrix as in this case. So you always get a solution there. If, if it's uh, the correct solution, that, that's another story. Okay, so, so that's the case of a solution. Well, uh, that, what I was saying that LSDANA is an explicit code for, to treat highly nonlinear problems. And at the end, when you do a simulation, just because it's a foundation to you, it will always give you a result. It will not stop for singularity issues, while Adams can, and it will, <laughs> if you make a mistake. You have to, as I said, as I was saying, when you, when you use LSDINA, for example, you, have, you will be given the, the possibility to check the energy associated to different uh, physics. So for example, there is kinetic energy, there is deformation energy, there is whatever kind of energy within, and then you will have to see this. If you have elastic energy, when you have a rigid motion, you made a mistake in the implementation. Okay. Okay. So I, I I do a little bit of digressions here and there, but I think it can be useful you know, to, to give you a little bit of overview of what is out there. Okay. Um, so again, we, we will try to see if we have this misrepresentation, these errors in for the element types that we have derived so far, which are two. <laughs> so we are kind of limited. Uh, so one is check to the is a parametric element. Okay. 
OK. So let's uh, import a picture here. I think it should be this one here. OK. Well, you can, you can actually leave it here. So what we are doing here is that we consider our 2D rectangular element, uh, beam, uh, sorry, uh, rectangular uh, is isoparametric element uh, for a rigid motion. So we have our element, and then we just, you know, impose a, a displacement R and a rotation theta, as we have learned to do many times. What we want to know now is to let's try to calculate to estimate what is the elastic energy associated to this motion, to this rigid motion. If it's not zero, then we have that problem. Let's see. So, uh, so we impose rigid motion. To the element, this one here. Uh, this means, for example, that in terms of nodal coordinates, we have the following. So, for example, if we impose that motion there that we see on the right, let's derive, for example, the nodal coordinate E1. Can you guess what it is? So it's basically, so this is R1, no? We just have to elaborate a little bit on the picture. So this one here is R1. Okay, is the component along the X1 of R. Then, but you know, that's not exactly E1, no? We have to remove this, this first part here. E1 is only this one here. Okay, it's not all of it, so we have to remove something. To remove that part, huh, we have to elaborate a little bit. So, uh, again, this is B. This is B, and this is, as you, as we have said before, this is C. Okay. Okay. So, um, sorry, sorry. The position E1 is not this one. I made a mistake. The position E1 is this one. Sorry. Um, the position E1 is this one. Okay, of course. Then we have to remove this one. Okay. So let's estimate it. So it's basically, uh, what I would do is to basically take this, then remove this, so we have this, then you have the cosine of this, which is this, and then you remove it to R1. Okay, okay. So if we do it, it's minus what? Okay, we have C tangent of theta, and that's this part here. Uh, let's make it like this so it's clear. This is basically C tangent of theta. Okay. And then you remove B. And B is this one, okay. So it's B minus this, okay. 
And then you have to do, you multiply it by the cosines of theta to get this. And you remove it to R1, and this is E1, okay? Now, I will not do this for all the elements, for all the other coins, otherwise we get to the final of the course. <coughs> but I can give you the results. And this is in fact, so R1 minus D cosines of theta plus C sinus of theta. Huh? Now, for all nodes, you can get back, eh? no problems, we are not in a hurry. Okay. We have the following. So E, which is again the vector of nodal coordinates, is the following. So the first one we have already got, and it's the following one. Okay, by an analogous reasoning, you get all the, uh, all the rest of the coordinates over two minus B. Then you have R1. And you have E4, which is R2. And you have Y, which is R1. Uh, so here I made a mistake because we have R8. It's a uh, Okay, so it's longer than expected. C5. I mean, this is just for you to know. I will not expect you to the arrival of this uh, at, the, at the exam. Maybe the first one. Okay. Okay. So now. This is basically the imposition of, uh, um, if you want, the local, uh, of the local coordinates. Uh, so this is basically the equivalent of writing E equal to Okay, so if this is true, if this is true, 
we get the following. Our P, which is again C, which uh, you know, elaborates on this. So you, you basically have E. Hmm? So you, oh, sorry, you substitute this, this expression here, so this one, in here. Okay, because this we have already we already know the shape matrix because we have derived it. That's universal for that kind of uh, element. Okay, it does not depend on the kind of motion. And if you do it, you get this. X one zero cosine of theta. R2 Okay So this is the display the position field expressed by the 2D isoparametric element in case of a rigid motion Tomorrow we will see what is the elastic energy associated to this position field, and we will see if it's zero or not. And then we will do the same for the beam element. And then we will see that there are problems. <laughs> okay. so just for the sake of clarity. Are there questions? Okay. So the idea is to, to see tomorrow that uh, we will have problems in one of these two formulations. And this will lead to the need to derive an alternative formulation with respect to the absolute nodal formulation that we have encompassed so far. Okay, so if there is no question from home, I will close here the lecture. Okay, stop the recording. <laughs>